never never been described as whizzing in now before, so that's, that's <laughs> interesting. Um, I was asked to come and talk about prides and prides around the world. So I'm not 100% clear what I'm going to talk about, um, but uh, I've got a couple of things so you don't have to look at me all the time to on the screen, and they will they will bring out some of the stories. Um, let me just ask, does anyone not know who Harvey Milk was? Don't, or I should, should say, who knows who Harvey Milk was? Okay. Looks like most hands up. Anyone who doesn't know, don't be shy. Okay, good. So we've got a couple of people who don't. So, very briefly, um, my uncle was the first openly gay elected official to a major office in the U.S. Um, that was in, uh, he started running for office in 1972. Uh, he was elected in 1977, and he served 11 months in public office as a um, very, the city county of San Francisco has a parliament, and he got a seat on that uh, city council. And um, uh, Harvey was not only the first openly gay elected official in the U.S. to a major public office, he was very loud, and he was asking people to come out. And you have to realize that when he started running for public office, he started by saying people must be visible. And when he was running for public office, it was illegal to be gay in the United States, and in California even, and it was considered a severe mental illness by the American Psychiatric and Psychological Association. They were still doing um, uh, shock, electric shock therapy. Parents could have someone who came out to their, to their, as a gay kid, they could be institutionalized for being gay. And so here you have this guy coming out and saying, uh, I'm gay and it's okay and other people should be free to be who they are. So um, the other uh, aspect about Harvey um, is that he was one of the first people um, in the LGBT community in the world to work in coalition with other minorities and to bring them together. He was the very first in the US to work with trade unionists. He was the first to reach out to the African American community, the Latino community, the Asian community. Um, and he believed that if all the minorities worked together, that we would be able to succeed in, in uh, protecting minority rights. Uh, he knew that he was gonna be killed, that was not Hollywood, that wasn't something that Sean Penn dreamed up. Um, if you see the documentary, which won the Academy Award for Best Documentary in 1985, it will tell you the whole story. But he knew he was going to be killed. He got death threats every single day. And Ann Cronenberg, who was his campaign manager, and I keep copies of the death threats because they were not anonymous, they were signed. Um, we have a big freedom of speech in the United States, so you can, as long as, you know, you, it's not against the law to threaten someone with death, you just can't actually do it. Um, uh, so he knew he was going to be killed. He didn't know it would be Dan White, who was, another, who was a former supervisor on the board of supervisors, but he knew he was going to be killed. So his quote, let the bullets that smash through my brain smash through every closet door. Let those bullets take everyone's mask off. Let these bullets take down everything in your life that, that says to be inauthentic, to not be your authentic self. And that was really his dream. In my conversations with my uncle, his dream was that we would get to a day where we are closer today than we were obviously 40 years ago, where people could be who they are and um, bring their own passion and purpose to the world because they're authentic. Uh, I'm often asked as a family member if I'm sad that my uncle didn't get to see a day like today where we have marriage equality building in uh, a couple dozen nations and we have LGBT uh, people that are being out in sports and in cinema and in government. And I always say that my uncle did see that this day. But he, he dreamed it. That's what gave him the courage to know going in every day knowing that he was going to be killed. Um, he believed that his life was worth giving so that he could free people, not just in the U.S., but around the world, who are not just LGBT, but who are different. And so uh, one of the things, if you read any of my uncle's writings or you get closer to, to um, his story, is that he believed very strongly that we can't, as um, any minority community, leave behind other minority communities. 
So he would be one of the major voices today that would be speaking out against xenophobia that we see going on um, throughout the world that we would see. He would be speaking out against the fact that women are still, um, in most of the world, um, tremendously marginalized um, and that uh, minority groups are being legally, per uh, uh, legally attacked. Um, I want to talk just a minute about Lula Watson and why the Milk Foundation does global work. Um, I got to go to my first, um, my first trip abroad, I was 25, it was 1985, I got to go to the closing conference of the UN Decade for Women in Nairobi, Kenya. And I got there and most people looked like me, which was really strange. I had been working on the Equal Rights Amendment, which we never got passed, which was a women's rights amendment in the United States. And this woman, Lil Watson, has become a friend of mine, got up and said to a room of people who look like me, if you've come here because you want to support me or women of color, go home. We have nothing to do together. And you could hear a pin drop in that room. Um, it was, had been a buzz, 3,000 people. And she said, look, if you've come here, let me be clear, if you've come here because you want to support women, you want to support women of color, go back home. We have nothing to do together. But if you've come here because you understand that your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. That stayed with me from 1985 and from my conversations with her. That it's in our own self-interest to make sure that people aren't discriminated against. It's in our own self-interest to make sure that no minority, that no one who's different from us has to put on a mask or gets treated differently. And it really was such a, a it, was, it was one of those aha moments in my life when she sat down with me and talked to me about how powerful self-interest is. And don't let people say they're helping you from an altruistic viewpoint because they want to help. Let them help you because they understand it's in their own self-interest to help you. And it certainly is. Um, there's Lula today. We've got great progress in the U.S. I know some of you met Rufus, um, uh, who uh, was a big fundraiser for the president. And one of the ways you get rewarded by raising a lot of money in our presidential campaigns is you get to be ambassadors. And he's a great ambassador. People always say, how do you get to be an ambassador? Raise several million dollars for a candidate. Um, the president has done tremendous work around LGBT. We have a milk stamp. Um, in fact, I'm going to give, I was teasing Lars earlier, I'm going to give Lars, this was given out at the White House ceremony, so the president hosted a ceremony for a postage stamp, that little <laughs> corner of an envelope in the U.S. is a big deal to get a postage stamp. You have to be dead, you have to have contributed, you have to be American, all these things. Um, anyway, so here is one of those. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, the Milk Foundation, we do work all around the world. Um, I want to talk a little bit about pride and a little bit, and the way I'm going to do that is to talk about a couple of stories of people who have my uncle style courage in the world today and who do it in the form of pride celebrations, LGBT pride celebrations. Um, has anyone here been to a pride in an Eastern European country? <coughs> anyone here been to a pride in Hungary? Has anyone heard about what's happening in Hungary from a governmental standpoint? Okay. Um, well, in 2009, there was a very, uh, pride, Hungary was the first former Soviet Union to have an LGBT pride celebration. And it went off, wasn't, in, wasn't celebrated by the whole community, but it went off, it wasn't violent, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't disruptive, it was okay. Um, but, and they were one of the first countries to have a civil union law in the former Soviet satellite countries. But uh, Hungary took a step back in 2009, and elected a center-right government, an ultra-right um, uh, party called the Jobbik Party, gained uh, they were the fourth largest party at the time, and now they're the third largest party in um, Hungary. And their agenda was an agenda that my uncle would have actually had a lot of resonance with, because the people who were fighting my uncle were um, a woman named Anita Bryant, who was a former Miss America, orange juice queen, we called her. Um, she sold orange juice. But she had a shopping list of people who were bad for the country, and homosexuals were the number one thing. So if anyone that saw the movie Milk knows that my uncle said, I'm here to recruit you. 
Because he wouldn't allow someone to steal words and make them tainted against a community. And so when she said that homosexuals are recruiting children, he would start every speech, I'm here to recruit you. Um, and then he would say, I'm here to recruit you for justice, liberty, for people to be authentic, and explain what really we're recruiting people for. Um, and so he would feel pretty comfortable in terms of, or familiar with the shopping list that the Yovics have. So the Yovic shopping list are women, gays, Roma, immigrants, Jews. Everybody who was on Anita Bryant's shopping list is on the shopping list of the Yovic party. But they were very violent. And so the 2009 Pride was, was tremendously violent, um, including um, deaths and um, uh, in 2010, we got a call, can we please come, they can get no international organizations <laughs> or international speakers to support Pride. And so in 2010 I went, and um, I don't speak Hungarian, and the press was on me, and I, you know, they gave me a bullhorn, I don't speak Hungarian, and there was maybe, you know, as many as six, seven hundred marchers, half of them were Hungarian, and, um, and there was about 25,000 counter demonstrators. Um, what we would call in the US neo-Nazis because they actually do use the Nazi insignia as one of their, um, as one of the yoga party's um, uh, attributes. And so um, this young man, his name is Milan Rosa, um, answered that call. I said, can someone please speak Hungarian? And you don't have to go on TV. He said, no, I'll go on TV too. So this young 20-year-old named Alain Rosa um, took the bullhorn, got on TV. Um, he had watched, he was inspired by my uncle's story, had seen the Sean Penn movie Milk, um, and he did this amazing job. Um, and uh, Milan, uh, I will, I'm going to have to shorten this story, but that, I don't go to the party. So I know you're, you guys are going to have a couple parties this week, and I usually come in, I get to do things like this, and then I try to get some sleep for my next flight or whatever. But he, um, you know, he went to the party, and uh, the party was at a venue that said No Roma. So he did an action right there and started uh, teaching the LGBT community why they shouldn't be going into this venue because it has a No Roma sign. What, what, what a hypocrite we would be. So he was... So he was doubly on TV because he was also doing this, and the press covered that as well. So um, I went on to Brussels, and um, I got a, a telephone call that Milan had gone home to his family's home that night and opened the door, and his father was hanging from, uh, his father had killed himself in the middle of their living room, and wrote a note to Milan saying, you've disgraced the family. Um, now. Milan's father knew that he was gay, but anyone who spent any time in the gay, um, in the gay environment that is right in modern day Hungary is you don't talk about it. It's kind of like what it was in the U.S. 40 years ago. You can be gay, just don't talk about it, and the family expects you not to talk about it as well. He was very close to his father, so here this 20-year-old was despondent. Um, I was in Brussels and um, was, was Skyping with him and talking with him. And then I get a call from Prague. <clears throat> now, the Czech Republic was the last former Soviet satellite to have a Pride. This was also 2010. And uh, Czech Lof, who runs the, the Pride organization, called and said, we've tried to get everyone. No one will come. That's usually the Harry Milk's thing. We can't get anyone. No one can come. Can you come? And so um, they call us. And, um, and when they told me that President Klaus asked people to rise up and stop the debauchery that would be gay pride. Of course, I had to go, and um, and going to Prague, going to to um, uh, Prague, uh, they picked me up at the airport and they said, you know, we don't. This is our first pride. We don't have a street long rainbow flag. <coughs> and um, anyone who's been to a pride parade knows we love these street long rainbow flags. And there's a couple of reasons. The old reason was, or in the old days, is that if you had a street long rainbow flag, you might have 40 people, but it would seem like 400 because you had this big flag in the street. So it's a very good thing to have, and we never know how many people are going to show up at a pride, at least in, even in Prague in 2010. But they said, do you mind if we stop at the bus station? There's a young kid who, um, who's bringing us a street long 
rainbow flag. Um, he's got to take off from work and he's took a, a, a nighttime bus to get here. And so we go and sure enough that bus door opens and there's Milan. And I, this is very difficult for me to always tell the story because I started to tear up when I saw him. And he, this 20 year old, says to me, let's not cry today. Let's, we're, today we're here to support um, the people in the Czech Republic. Um, so he went on, um, I brought him up on stage at, at um, at uh, Pride in, uh, in, in uh, the Czech Republic. He went on to lead the battle for not just LGBT rights, but he was the voice in Hungary for rights of any group of people that was being marginalized or diminished. They would go to this kid who, out of his first activism, resulted in his father's killing himself out of this horrible tragedy. And so, um, I was worried about Milan. Um, I took him to the White House. He met the president. He met the first lady. He, we spent a long time with, with Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid. And, and, uh, he continued to be the voice of not just LGBT activism, but he wanted, he put LGBT face on the community. In a place like Hungary where people don't talk about being gay, and I can tell you, just a year ago, we did an event at the embassy there. It was an LGBT-focused event. We had no LGBT people <coughs> at the embassy event. This was just a year ago. We had people from the Roma community, the Jewish community, women's organizations, but the gays that, were, that we knew of in the, and that the embassy reached out to were too afraid to show up at an LGBT event. Um, so he got people together. This was for um, the flood that happened on the Danube. He made sure that people knew that LGBT people were, were also shoring up the side. Um, when the Roma community continued to be attacked, he was out there speaking for it. This was at a Ramadan festival. This was at schools. He started to go into schools. Milan made this himself from uh, his uh, work with the Milk Foundation. And this was one of the pictures that he was most proud of. This was Milan. This was, and this is when they were going to um, uh, take away the right of free passage in Hungary. And this was Milan um, speaking to the national press. Um, so he became this amazing, courageous voice. You know, this used to be a great story, but last year the story changed for me when Milan was killed. So um, on November 9th, 2014, a little more than a year ago, Milan was killed. And so, um, and this is, this, you know, in a way, um, uh, you're surprised, but in a way you're not surprised. I mean, I have so, he's one of the, one of the activists that helped, wanted me to tell his story and that allowed me to, but I have activists that I've worked with in the Middle East and in Asia who are also no longer with us, but they didn't want their story told. They didn't want their family to know about uh, to, or to feel something. And Milan wanted this story told. So Milan, uh, very similar trajectory in some ways to my uncle. The night that he was, that he was um, thrown in front of a train, um, they, there was a, a spontaneous candlelight vigil. Uh, people marched in the streets. Um, finally, they got some voices, and they even renamed, even the Jovic party, by the way, it was really strange, the Jovic party, which is fiercely anti-LGBT, anti, -LGBT, anti uh, xeno has tremendous xenophobia, anti-Semitic, um, anti-women, um, they said that it was a loss that Milan was killed. It was a little strange. Um, so Milan is one example. I want to talk about Peru for a minute. Um, this is uh, Lima. Um, Lima's, um, Lima is one of the places where it's also, you don't talk about being LGBT. LGBT people are, con you know, even the cardinal, um, and it's a very large Catholic country in terms of the population, but the, the cardinal will call people American all the time. We have one openly gay member of their parliament, and uh, the cardinal said that he was American. I wasn't, even though that I'm gay, but American means faggot, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, um, but brutal LGBT crimes exist in, um, in, uh, in Peru. And so Carlos, you'll see next to me, is um, uh, uh, Congressman uh, Carlos, and he, um, 
Carlos Bruce, he's the one who brought me to Peru for, uh, they timed their pride to be with this vote on civil unions. Congress voted against the civil union law, and we did a march. Now this is, I'm gonna use uh, someone's story here to talk about what one person can do and how one person can change the world without putting their life at risk. So a young kid named Cesar Parra was at the vote and before the march, um, and the press went to him and asked him, you know, are you in favor of these gay and lesbian people? And he said, yes. He says, do you think we should have civil union laws? And he said, yes. And they said to him, are you gay? And he was silent for a few minutes. There's good video footage of this. And he said, yes. And they said, when did you come out? And he said, just now. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. And that was viral. That was, that was on every news station in Peru. But not only that, they then, um, and, and there he is, um, and, and not only that, but they followed throughout the whole march. And then there was another piece to this story that also broke through tremendous barriers in Peru. At the end of the march, when we got up on this uh, stage to speech, uh, to speak, his mother showed up. Now his mother was called, and this was reported in the press, but she told the story, his mother was called by her brother, by Cesar's uncle, and she said, do you know that you have a maricon in the family? And apparently she hung up on her uncle, and she's devoutly Catholic. She came down there, and she sees him, and he sees her, and they're both crying, and she embraced, and she's like, I don't care what the church says, I don't care if you are my son, there's nothing wrong with you, and it was just this wonderful moment. And, um, and that got shown on TV as well, and it humanizes LGBT people. That visibility is so important. Um, I talk about this all the time because, uh, because people have to realize that, um, that there's some messaging right now that says we should get to the day when LGBT people don't have to announce who they are, when it doesn't matter. And it will always matter. Uh, we're not, you know, my, my uncle used to tell me, and I would repeat it, he said, you know, if LGBT people could turn purple overnight, there would be no discrimination because we'd be everywhere. We'd be visible, but we can't. We don't turn pink or purple or have rainbow colors when we're born. And so this is always going to be a struggle. There's always these difficulties. So one more story about pride, um, uh, another pride. I've got a whole bunch in here, but I'll tell you about Verona just because we're... In, I'm in Europe, and um, a lot of people think Italy is a cool, safe place for LGBT people, and I can tell you it's not. So another situation, um, Verona, by the way, has a Harvey Milk LGBT center named after my uncle. It's been there for about 10 years. There's one in Insomnia in Paraguay, and of course, lots of things named after my uncle in the U.S. But um, when I went there last March, they said, you know, we haven't been able to have a pride in 13 years. Um, and they said, we're, we're finally going to get one. Will you come back? And it really didn't fit in my schedule. But then the, the former mayor, who's part of the Northern League, which, by the way, the Northern League is another kind of Jobbik-type um, party that's really gaining ground in Northern Italy. Um, the, the former mayor said um, that, uh, that he will not allow a pride to take place. And so the mayor, the current mayor, said, well, I'm going to allow it anyway, and we're bringing in Stuart Milk. And he said, well, well then I'm going to shoot you and Stuart Milk. So when you say that, we lose State Department funding, but I still get to go. <laughs> so the embassy's like, well, we can't pay for this now. But um, we went, and, this, and we had a press conference, and this young man named Alex, um, and he's, again, another person who's allowed me to tell a story, who runs Archie Gay in Verona. Now this, again, will tell you about a little bit about what's going on in the world. So Archie Gay is the gay rights organization, the, the national one, and then there's chapters, um, the predominant one in Italy. And um, he runs that, but his family didn't know he was gay, even though he's running this, and his work didn't know he was gay. And so, um, so Alex was caught in the press conference when I arrived there to shine a light on um, on LG, on their first Pride in 13 years. And by the way, the Northern League did a Pride that they called the Family Pride to counter the LGBT Pride. And I'll tell you the result of that in a second. But Alex um, got caught in the camera, and his boss 
who's part of this um, current Catholic Church-sponsored initiative called Gender Studies. It's basically how can we teach people to be anti-gay, but they call it gender studies. <laughs> um, and, um, and it's a very big program that's throughout Italy right now. And his boss led the gender studies program in Verona. And so he, when, so his boss saw it and called him and said, I just saw you on TV, Alex, call me. And he was petrified. And so, and he knew his boss not only was part of the gender studies, but his boss would, at the drop of a hat, make a homophobic remark. Um, Any time he could make fun of someone because he perceived them to be LGBT, he would. So when his boss called him, he said, Alex, I just saw you on TV. And he called his boss, thinking the worst. Um, and his boss said, Alex, you're a leader in work, and you're a leader in life. And I'm leaving this gender studies program. So that visibility is... is is, and by the way, his story made it on uh, La Repubblica, the national Italian newspaper, because you know, at, at the Pride, which was very successful, would be successful by Denmark standards, even in terms of people waving back. Very few people waved back. But we didn't get the type of hatred that you see in Hungary, where you have to keep people, where you have to have 10,000 SWAT police between you and the marchers. Um, there was very little way back, but there wasn't, there wasn't this tremendous disgust and hatred that we see in a lot of other places. So there was a lot of hope for Verona. Um, the family pride, um, ended, which, which was getting a lot of support, I spent two days talking to the press about how, if you want to see a family pride, go to the LGBT event. That's where I said, they're not going to get to use the word family. This is what family, family doesn't take someone, a member of their family, and say, we're not including you. You, family is embracing of everyone. And so, and the press ended up talking, well, Milk is saying this is LGBT pride, is family pride as well, and the family pride had very few people show up, and, and the first Verona pride in 13 years was, was a, a very successful event. Um, this was, I know Lars is going to Lithuania this year for Baltic Pride. Um, I just want to use the example of what we're faced. I mean, Baltic Pride was not as bad as Hungary, but about half of the people there would love to tear you apart. And, and the other half of the people kind of wave at you. And, um, but for Baltic Pride, um, we did a, a, a conference. Let's see if I have the picture. Um, but this was uh, at Baltic Pride, uh, Ambassador Rufus is gone, I can, um, I can tell you that uh, I was invited by the embassy there and I actually thought I would never be invited again because um, they targeted me and they targeted the Swedish foreign minister and she had secret service with her, um, with eggs. And they pelted us both with eggs and I kind of heard my uncle and I wouldn't let them take the eggs off of me, although she got cleaned up. And, um, the embassy evacuated all Americans for the rally. They thought the situation was too dangerous, and I refused to go. Um, and that, to me, was one of my rights as an American citizen. I'm, um, and having been in Hungary, I didn't feel endangered there. But the press was not reporting about this being the first major pride march in the Baltics. And so I said, this is going to be an opportunity to see if the press could not take a good story. So covered with eggs, I got up there and I said, look, you can you know, throw eggs at me and the Swedish foreign minister. You can send bullets to my uncle. You may be able to stop the messenger, but you can't stop the message. We will all be equal and free. And that was the front page, reluctantly, of all of the Lithuanian papers the next day. Um, but these struggles go on. I know that Lars is going, and I, would, and I know he was with me in Riga, but I, Lithuania is a little bit different, so you may unfortunately still have some struggles. Vietnam, uh, we've made great progress there. Um, uh, national Vietnamese television covered our support. Vietnam was really interesting to see. There's no legal gathering of people anywhere. It's a communist country still, in the truest sense of the words, although they've embraced capitalism. It's very strange. Um, but, uh, but there's no right to assemble or to have, um, but you should see the, the young LGBT Vietnamese who would be on their bicycles. They do, instead of a parade, it's a bike ride. But to see police stopping traffic in Hanoi 
first of all, to see them stopping traffic, period, is amazing. <laughs> because there is no stopping it. You're, those smoke vents just keep coming. But to see them stop traffic for this Pride bike ride was just, mm -hmm. I mean, it was like they had just won a million euros. I mean, they were just, it was just so incredible to see, to see that. These are some, this, these are some pictures of, um, I oftentimes hear people say, that once the older generation dies out, that LGBT rights, women's rights, immigrant rights won't be a problem anymore. And I just want, this, is, this was uh, when we were in Greece, this is the Golden Dawn group who was protesting Pride. I mean, this is not, you know, people who are in their 50s. And there's a lot of young people, especially people who are out of work and hear a message that who's to blame for you being out of work? Women, Jews, gays. Immigrants, um, the Roma community. By the way, you know we we we've had a struggle in Hungary with some of our own volunteers who say, you know, we'll work, we'll do anything, we'll work with everyone, but we won't work with the Roma. And if you can't work, if you can't support Roma rights, then you can't be, you know, part of the Harvey Milk Foundation. Um, the labels that are put on that community are just as bad as any label that we've had. So. Um, that, th those are some of the stories. I hope that, that hearing some of those, I've got a great story from Vietnam of, a, of the street, street vendor. Um, a lot of the food in Vietnam um, is sold on is street food, and it's a very hard life, but there was a, a woman, she's, there's three PFLAG mothers that I met in Vietnam, and one of them is a, is a street vendor who stood up for her son. Very inspiring woman. She didn't. She she works like 20 hours a day um, in her in her um, uh, restaurant. That's just, that she has to move every day. She has got to take up the entire her the the cooktop, the the little chairs that people sit on, and she's standing up for her sissy boy. Um, and just very very inspiring to see the strength. I mean, other street vendors spit on her, um, and she's just refusing to not stand up for her son. Um, Wonderful, inspiring figures all around Pride events. Um, uh, and I can go on and on with more stories. I want to make sure that there's an opportunity for, for questions. But I do want to end just the formal part of my conversation going back to Lilla Watson again. And, you know, whether you're LGBT or you're an ally, um, whether you're an immigrant or a non-immigrant, whether you're, you know, cis male or not, um, whether you um, have belief in a faith organization or don't, just realize that, um, that it is in your own self-interest. It's in our self-interest as a family unit. It's in our interest as a uh, community, a city, a state, a continent, and the world that we support everyone's differences and that we realize there's a Native American phrase that my uncle loved to share with me that we and our differences are the medicine that will heal the world even when the world doesn't do it our differences makes that medicine more powerful not what we have in common but our differences and so it's very very important um, that we look at those differences as being in our own self-interest a good thing not a bad thing so I will take questions yeah.